This is Case Closed, Crime Stories from the Golden Age of Radio. Welcome back to Case Closed, your weekly hour of old-time radio crime, brought to you every Wednesday by RelicRadio.com. Our first story this week comes from the Crime Club. We'll hear their episode from June 12th, 1947, titled Death is a Knockout. After that, it's Conspiracy, the April 24th, 1950 episode of Murder by Experts. Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Death is a knockout. Yes, we have that story for you. Come right over. chair by the window. Comfortable? The manuscript is on this shelf. Here it is. Death is a knockout. A very exciting story of a golden opportunity that was melted down by murder. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. It was the night of the Joey Troy Billy Sampson light heavyweight boxing match, and the crowd was already pushing into Madison Square Garden, filling it up. A few blocks away, another match was taking place in a small cafe between Hank Barnum, a sports writer, and lovely Ann Cooper, a reporter. For Pete's sake, Ann, you might try to be reasonable. Don't tell me, Hank. You're a personal friend of Pop Evans, Joey (sighs) Troy's manager. You were the first one to give Joey Troy a break in print. There are no more tickets left. Oh, Oh, why didn't you ask me a few days ago? I might have been able to swing a pass. I didn't see what I see now. Oh, what do you see now? A human interest story. The romance between Joey Troy and that girl of his. What's your name? Mabel Smith. Oh, yeah. Oh, but, Anne, that's been going on for years. I told you all about it. It was never important until tonight. And tonight? I've got a yen to do a feature. Joey Troy, the brainless wonder, fighting for a crack at the champ. Tonight, Billy Sampson. Next year, the champ. Who pushed him up the cliff to those dizzy heights? Pop Evans. No, dear, not according to my story. It was a girl who stuck to him, inspired him, gave him the will to make good. Oh, by the way, who's that gorgeous redhead coming this way? Huh? Oh, that's Mabel Smith. I figured you'd be having dinner in this joint. You mind if I sit down? Mabel, this is Ann Cooper. Hello. Yeah. Hank, i got to talk to you about something very important. Okay, go ahead. What about her? Uh, She's all right. Well, okay. There's trouble, Hank. You enjoy? No, it's Marty French. He wants Pop to get Joy to throw the fight. Uh But Pop ain't doing it, and that means that... Uh, No, no, Take it easy, Mabel. What's the proposition? 50000 if Joey takes it on the chin in the fourth round. Well, why didn't Pop tell me about it? He's scared stiff. If the story broke in the papers, the fight might be called off. Would that be bad for Joey's morale? He don't know what's cooking, Miss Cooper. We didn't tell him. Why not? Because he's a dumb cluck who gets mad. He'd go after Marty and kill him. What do you want me to do, Mabel? You're going to be in Joey's corner tonight like always? Yep. Well, keep an eye on the towels they wipe his face with between rounds. Make sure there's no drug on him. All right, honey. I'll do what I can. I'll be watching from the eighth row ringside. So long, Hank. I'll see you later. Oh, goodbye, Miss Cooper. Goodbye, Mabel. Well, there's going to be a hot time in the old town tonight. And I'm burning up because I won't be there. Are you listening to me, Joey? Sure, Pop. You know I always listen to you. Now, keep pushing him. Don't give him a chance to get sick. You want me to take him this round, Pop? I'll let you know. You better tell me now, Pop. I don't hear so good when I'm fighting. Well, there's the buzzer, kid. Now, we've got to clear it out. But, Pop, what do I do? Go after him. But don't leave yourself open. Okay, I'll knock him out. Now, Pop, that's the fourth round coming up. Now, what's so special about the fourth round, Hank? Nothing. Could be a lucky number. Yeah, is that all? Well, what's the matter with you tonight? You've been barking at me like a mutt. Well, what's the idea of checking the stuff we take in the ring? There's no harm in smelling the towels, is there? Well, it ain't necessary either. Joey, get after him. You got him going now. Use both hands. Both hands. Don't give him a chance to get set. He's going to knock him out, Hank. He's going to knock him out. Both hands, Joey. Don't let him get off the ropes. Pop, what's the matter? Uh, I don't... Pop. Pop Evans. Hey, somebody get a doctor, quick. <laughs> I didn't think you'd do it, Hank. 
I didn't think you'd try to commit murder with 20,000 people around it. Abel, are you sure you saw the gun? I told you. Marty French was sitting next to me. I know where the shot came from. I didn't hear a thing, and there isn't a mark on Pop. There was a shot, Hank. Marty was telling me how tough it would be if me and Joy never got married. And then Joy went to work on oh, Billy Samson, and then he... He's coming, too. Oh, shot. Shot. You see? He heard it, too. That's when he fainted. Shot. Joy. Joy. Ah, take it easy, Pop. You gotta relax. Let me up. I gotta see Joy. He's been shot. Ah, he's all right, I tell you. Where is he? Upstairs winning a fight for you. Hiya, pals. Marty. Yeah. I saw them carry your weight, Pop. I thought maybe you had an accident. You tried to kill him. Me? Hey, what's this? Something for the press? You got a gun on you, Marty. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you. Huh? All right, if you'd rather talk to a cop. Hank, let's not have any trouble. Listen, Pop, are you afraid of this man? I don't want any trouble. <laughs> the way I let people talk about me. Chalk it up to a good mood. I got news. Joy lost. No, sweetheart. Your oh. dumb boyfriend is the leading contender now. He gets the first crack at the champ. When did it happen? Two minutes and 18 seconds, the seventh round. And I wasn't there to see him do it. I've been with him in every fight, and the biggest one so far... I'm taking pictures now, and he's talking on the radio. You know how much I dropped tonight, Pop? That's got nothing to do with us. A hundred grand, sister. But don't get me wrong. I'm not sore. <laughs> I'm considering it an investment. What does that mean, Marty? You know, Hank, I look at you and I get ideas. Stick around. I'll give you a story you'll never be able to write. Such as? Just stick around. Now, I bought a bottle of champagne. The best. What for? We're going to have a few drinks to Joey. To the next champ. Not with me, you're not. Okay, then beat it. What? Say, who do you think you're talking to? Pop, tell her what I mean when I say beat it. Maybe, maybe you better not wait for Joey. Yeah. All right. I know where I stand. I'll be at the apartment. What's the matter, Hank? You look puzzled. Pop. Uh, let me tell you. There was a deal on for tonight, and he reneged. I didn't take any money from him, Hank. He sent one of his gangsters to train and camp with an envelope. The sneak gave it to me and drove away. There was 20,000 bucks in it I didn't know. I promised you 30 more, didn't I? And I told you where to go. Where's the 20 grand? Where? Why, you dirty crook, I gave it back to you yesterday after Joey and I got back from the training camp. Oh, quit kidding, pal. You're not making any impression on the press. He is, Marty. I believe him. You don't say. Are you going to write about it? Huh? <laughs> we'll wait for Joey, huh? Maybe he'll want to drink some of this champagne with us. I'm depressed. You and Hank wasn't there to see me finish, Pop. What took you so long, Joey? Oh, they was taking a lot of pictures, moving pictures. Where's Mabel? She had to go home, kid. What for? She always waits for me to get to work and... She had to go home, big shot. I ain't talking to you, Marty. That's what you think. I don't want you to bother me. I don't feel so good. What's the matter, son? Get these gloves off me, Pop. Well, sure. You don't have to act like you're lost. I ain't putting them on never again. What? Now, what do you mean? I mean it. Fighting's too dangerous. What? Well, I'll be a monkey steps. Uh oh, wait a minute. Let's find out what he means. You know what almost happened in the ring tonight? What happens every time some guy hits me hard? What's that? I get mad, and I don't know what I'm doing, and I might kill some guy sometime, and then I'd be sorry. I oh, know you're tired, kid. Come on, I'll give you a rub down. I don't want to be sorry. I don't want to kill nobody. You haven't killed anybody yet, and you're not going to. Now. Come well, I'm scared, Pop. I never said it before because I don't want you to feel bad, but tonight... What's so different about tonight? I think they took Billy Sampson to the hospital, Hank. Oh. <laughs> You'll get over it, Joey. And next year, when you're beating the... I chance, don't want you to talk to me, Marty. Then you tell him, Pop. He's in the big money now. You're not letting him quit, are you? Listen, Joey, we've worked a long time to get you to the top. Now, what do you think you're going to do to Mabel if you walk out on us now? Mabel? She wants to be the champ someday. Maybe she wants you to be famous and have a lot of money. She's been waiting for you, son. For me to be champ? Sure she has. Now, if you quit now, you'll break her heart. That's worse than getting mad, ain't it? Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm just a dumb guy. I, I don't think. Open that bottle of champagne, Hank. We're celebrating. Open it yourself. I just seen a miracle go to waste. Okay, I don't mind. <laughs> is, is that the real stuff? Right out of my private cellar. You want to pour it? 
Yeah. I like champagne. I I'll get the glasses. Yeah, do that. And then we'll drink to the partnership of Marty French and Pop Evans. Partnership? I'm taking a half interest in Joey, Pop. For how much, Marty? The 20 grand I left him on deposit. And the 100 grand I lost on the fight. I got none of your money. Now get out of here. Now, wait a minute. First, you sign this paper. A partnership agreement. 50-50 on Joey as long as he fights. You're taking a big chance, Marty. Am I? Are you going to put it on the front pages, Hank? Or tell the district attorney? Okay. Then I say Pop took the money from me. Let him prove that he didn't. Hey, what's this I hear about a partnership? Pop? This is nothing for you to worry about, Joey. I don't want you taking him for no partner. I don't like him. Yeah, <laughs> You'll get over that, too. Well, I guess I picked the wrong time to be nice to you guys. Let's have the drinks. Yeah. Here's yours, Marty. And this one's for you, Pop. Yeah. I'll get yours and mine off this table, Hank. Here. One for you, one for me. Well, here goes to the next champ. Hey. Hey, this is good. Can I have another one? Sure, keep the bottle. Well, so long, pals. I'll see you tomorrow, Pop. Don't waste your time. You coming, Hank? With you. I said before, I look at you and I get ideas. Come on. Where? For a little walk. I got some plans I want to discuss with you. Not tonight, Marty. I'm spending it with nice people. I said, you're coming, Hank. <sighs> Would, um... That bulge in your pocket be loaded? You want proof? Good night, folks. So long, Hank. I'll be there, pal. Let's have it, Marty. What's the idea of pushing a gun at me through your pockets? <laughs> a gun? <laughs> you fooled easy, Hank. Take a look. A package of chewing gum. I'm going back. The gun's in the other pocket. Uh, I'm going with you. Yeah. Oh, here. Keep yourself entertained. Have a stick. No, thanks. Well, you uh, don't mind if I do a little uh, chewing, do you? you got a mouthful already. Yeah, that's how I like it. Keeps me busy. What about those plans you wanted to discuss with me? Oh, yeah. You and I are going to be boozing pals for the night. Really? In the morning, I suppose, you'll throw me over for a blonde. Ah. <laughs> you don't get it. We're going to be inseparable. You're going to be my alibi. Your what? Yeah, that's right. Something's liable to happen to one of those lugs in the dressing room. Now, look here, Marty. If you think your gorillas are going Don't to... Don't get excited. I said liable. And that means that I... Uh, uh, hey. hey, what's the matter with you? Uh, I don't know. I... Uh, Something just hit me in the stomach. And I... I got pains. Awful. I... Marty. Marty! Well, I'll be... He's dead. That's an exciting situation, isn't it? What do you think will come of it? We'll return to the story in a moment. You see, I'd like to talk to you for just a minute. As librarian of the crime club... I'm extremely interested in what you think of crime stories. And all of us will be very grateful to you for a short letter about them. Do crime stories supply a kind of relaxation for you after your day's work? Do they perhaps take your mind off the various problems that you'd like to forget for a little while? Do you find them interesting as sidelights on the minds of evildoers? And as illustrations of the eventual failure of evil? Won't you take just a few minutes to write to us to tell us why you listen to crime stories? Your thoughts are so important to us. A letter or a card will be most deeply appreciated. Won't you please write one to the Crime Club in care of the Mutual Broadcasting System, New York 18? You'll be doing a great service to us, and you'll be helping us in planning these programs for your enjoyment. The address is the Crime Club, care of the Mutual Broadcasting System... New York 18. May we hear from you? And you shall hear from us now as we continue the story of Death is a Knockout. Marty French 
is dead in the corridor outside Joey Troyer's dressing room. It is 15 minutes later, and in the dressing room... I tell you, Hank, Joey didn't put a thing in Marty's drink. Listen, Pop, the police are going to be here in a few minutes. They're going to ask a lot of questions. He was all standing around this rub-down table, wasn't he? Did you see him do anything out of line? Not here, but we didn't see him pour the champagne. Wait a minute, I don't like what you're saying, Hank. That ain't friendship. All I want's the truth. You take that back. Take it back. Stop it, Joey. Stop it. Stop. Okay, Pop, you're the boss. But he's got no right to put ideas in my head. All right, Joey, now get dressed. We're going home. Mabel's waiting. When did this happen, Pop? On the way home from the garden. After the cops told us we could go home, we dropped Hank and then Joey began to act up. I killed them, Mabel. Oh, shut up, you dumb Adonis. I remember while I was pouring the champagne, I was listening to Marty tell Pop he was a partner. I was getting madder every time he opened his mouth. It was a bottle of rubbing down stuff on the table with a skull and bones on the label. You didn't use it. Do you understand? I understand, honey, but maybe I did. Hank kept saying I did. What am I going to do with him? How can I go after a match with a champ as long as this idiot thinks he's a murderer? Matches and money. That's all you ever think about. Squeeze the gold out of him. What have I done to you? Mabel, that ain't no way to talk to Pop. Don't tell me how to talk. Why don't he let us get married? Why don't he cancel that no marriage clause in your contract? Well, I signed, Mabel. Did you know it was there? Did you even bother to read the paper? No, honey, I was a kid and Pop said it was okay, so I... Listen, Pop... Joey, have I been a good manager to you? Well, who says you wasn't? Didn't I take you into my house when you had nothing? I fed you, I clothed you, I built you up to be a leading contender? Well, I ain't complaining, Pop. All right, then, believe me, son, marriage is no good for you now. Not until you're the champ. You can't have too many things on your mind. You hear that, Mabel? I, I gotta do what Pop says. Oh, you make me sick. Even so, now that I'm thinking... You wouldn't want to get hitched to no murderer. That again, huh? Well, maybe you know why you killed Marty. Yeah, he was getting him Pop's hair. He made me mad. Pop's hair? Sure. Say, Pop, even if Joey had 50 managers, he'd still get his 60%. Of course. But a partner would cut your profit in half. What are you getting at, Mabel? You had a reason for killing Marty. And all the time you've been letting Joey think he did it. Now, that ain't so, Mabel. Pop ain't no killer. No. Watch me prove it. Get away from that phone, Try you. Try make me. Uh, I'm going to call the cops and I'm going to give them the whole setup between you and Marty. Drop that phone. Oh. Hey, hey, Pop, cut it, are you? twisting them off. Huh? Well, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to lose my temper. But I want no more talk of murder. Now, look, Ann Cooper, you may be the light of my life, but you haven't you, you, you haven't got a better reason... Hey, okay, darling, a, a girl can be lonesome. Oh, but, Ann, it, it's against the rules at 2 o'clock in the morning, and besides, I'm tired. Oh, well, then you're out of circulation. Good night, dear. <sighs> Good night. Oh. Oh, what... What is this, Lover's Lane... Go home and let me die in peace. All right, all right. But you better not be the milkman. Hank, I'm sorry to be bothering you. I think nothing of it, Mabel. I'm running open house. Joey's in trouble. Something besides murder. I'm serious. I just saw something in the papers. The coroner found poison in Marty's stomach. No kidding. And how'd it get there? Joey thinks he did it. Hank, you gotta help me. Joey's innocent, but when I left the apartment, he was talking about giving himself up. Now, that, Mabel, may be the only idea he ever had. I thought you were his friend. What motive did he have for killing that gambler? He's crazy about Pop, and Marty was trying to horn in. Sure, on Pop. Now, would Joey rub out a guy with poison? Ah. Uh, you think it was too subtle for him? I know it. He'd do it the hard way, with his knuckles. Could be. Say, Mabel... Was the glass that Marty drank the champagne from tested by the police for poison? I don't know. Why? Oh, I thought that might have been in the papers, too. How'd you like to drive downtown with me? Where to? The morgue. For a bird's eye view of Marty. Yeah, I'd like to, but I'd better stick close to Joey. In his frame of mind, you never know what he'll do next. Hello, McCann. Oh, it's you, Mr. Barnum. Come in. I'm always glad when somebody walks in here. How's business? Oh, very quiet. What brings you to us at this hour? Marty French. Oh, yes. Would you like to see his body? Not this minute, but I would like to examine his clothes. Are they here? You too? Who else? Well, there's a lady looking at him now. A lady? In the wardrobe room. 
She's very beautiful, Mr. Varnum. I don't often get a chance to... Uh, is she about uh, this tall? Yeah. And has she got blue eyes and a full mouth? A lovely mouth, Mr. Varnum. And uh, uh, when she walks, does she... Uh... Yes, Mr. Varnum, just like that. Is she a friend of yours? She was. I don't know who I envy you. A live woman. Oh. Hello, darling. Hank, what are you doing here? Are you still lonesome? You wouldn't take me to the fight. Did you know there was going to be a murder? No, Ann, dear, but that's no reason for you to be picking a dead man's pocket. The police said he was poisoned. He drank champagne a few minutes before he died, and there was no poison in his glass. Are you sure of that? That's what they told me. So I came here looking for a clue. Uh, I'm a reporter, remember? What did you find? Oh, nothing much. This package of cigarettes, some loose change, and this package of... Oh. And just imagine how I felt when I pulled that out of his pocket. Let that be a lesson to you. Where's the package of chewing gum? How'd you know about that? Ah, I'm psychic. Let me have it. Oh, Hank, it's my favorite brand. Well, you better switch, honey. That kind good is what for what ails you. If you want to stop ailing for good. <laughs> How can you be so sure that gum contains poison? You're a tough kid to convince, Ann. I like proof. All right. I'll give it to you. Here? Why not? It's a beautiful spring night and the bugs are in all their glory. Pardon me if I think you've gone. What? Bugs. Hmm, thank you, sweetheart. I take a stick of this gum, unwrap it, break it up into little pieces, and lay them on the sill of the car window. Well, my mother always told me never to trust a sports writer. In a few seconds, little bugs with wings will zoom out of the atmosphere to nibble at the bait. Ah, and won't they be surprised? You're so cruel. Ah, here they come. Look at them go for that sugar-coated poison. Ha <laughs> ha. Have a good time, little brothers. You're helping me find a murderer. Oh, what? Hank, those bugs... Yes, isn't it amazing? They're dying like flies. <laughs> Joey, will you stop moping and go to bed? I ain't staying here in the apartment with you. I want Mabel. Oh, I don't know where she is. I've looked all over town for her. You ain't telling me the truth, Joey. Uh, Joey. You don't like Mabel. You, you, you twist it around. What's the matter with you, boy? You're like a wild animal. Yeah, a wild animal. I get mad and I don't know what I'm doing. I could kill a guy and not know I'm doing it. Oh, come on. Now you're tired. Go to bed. Sleep it off. Mm, I notice you getting mad like that, too. If I killed anybody, I'd know about it. That's where you got it on me, Pop. Everybody knows I'm a dope. What are you trying to do, pin that murder on me? Mabel said you got the reason, didn't she? So that's it. Well, now listen to me, son. I'm not taking the nap for you or anybody else. Ha! What's so funny about that? You ain't so smart, Pop. I just tripped you up. Huh? You seen me do it, didn't you? So you do what? You saw me slip the poison in the glass. Now look at here, Joey. I don't want any more talk. Go to bed. I'm going to find Mabel. And then I'm going to give myself up to the cops. Look, Joy, please listen to me. You've got a brilliant career. We worked hard. We're near the top. You can't throw it away. Get out of my way, Pop. Think of me. I'm an old man. I can't go out and start looking for somebody else now. It takes years to build a good fight, and I haven't got the time. Pop, you're making me mad. You owe me something. I pulled you out of a pool room and made you into a human being. You're not going to let me down. I don't want to give it the effort. I don't want it. Pop. Pop, you on right? Don't lay there like it was dead. I didn't mean to hit you. Roaming around in Central Park at four o'clock in the morning. What do you think we are, Hank? A couple of sailors? I don't like it any more than you do, Anne, but we've got to find Joy. We're not going to find him. Hmm. You want to bet? Huh? There he is, sitting on that bench under the obelisk. Well, of all things... His favorite spot. That's where he met Mabel for the first time. Shh. Hello, Joey. Uh, oh, it's you, Hank. Yeah, and this is Ann Cooper. How do you do? Pleased to meet you. What are you doing here, Joey? I couldn't find Mabel, so he wanted to be alone with my thoughts. Oh, you poor thing. Did she throw you over for a wrestler? She wouldn't do nothing like that. She's a good kid. Now, calm down, Joey. Have you seen Pop recently? Yeah, about an hour ago. And you know he's dead. Huh? What are you trying to give me, Hank? He ain't dead. He was when we saw him, Joey. Well, I hit him on the jaw because he made me mad, but I brung him through and he went to bed. We didn't find him in bed. He was on the floor. 
somebody had cracked his skull with a hammer. Wait a minute. Are you saying it was me? Would I dare? Not if you know what's good for you. Oh, why, Mabel. Mabel, honey. I figured you might be sweating it out here, Joy. I couldn't find you anyplace else. They're telling me I killed Pop. Don't pay any attention to them. They're not your friends. So you know about Pop, too, huh? Why shouldn't I? I found him and I called the cops. Would you know who killed him? One of Marty's boys. And Pop got it because he killed Marty. Is that what you told the police? Yes. And I gave him the whole inside story about Pop and Marty, too. Well, I guess that settles that. Ah, uh, how about some gum? You got some, Hank? Mm-hmm. Right here. What kind is it? A popular kind. The kind Marty used to chew all the time. We found it in the pocket of his coat at the morgue. Huh? Uh, you're not afraid of it, are you, Joey? I ain't afraid of nothing. Give me a piece. Okay. One for you, too, Mabel? No. I never chew. Oh, that's too bad. How about you, Ann? I don't mind. Uh, don't uh, forget to take the paper off, dear. Stop it, Joey. Huh? What's the Don't put that gum in your mouth. Why not, Mabel? Come on, Joey. We're getting out of here. Just a minute. We've got a few things to talk about first. And if you add them up, they'll total like murder. Uh, tell me, Ann. Do you think the automobile will ever replace the horses? This is much more romantic. Carriage ride in Central Park. By the dawn's early light. Yeah. And, darling. Well, uh, hold your horses, Hank. Uh. When did you decide that Mabel killed Marty? When you found that package of chewing gum. He wasn't killed by the champagne, so therefore, and to wit... But how could she have slipped it into his pocket? You were all in Joey's dressing room together. She didn't do it there. She performed that bit of hocus-pocus during the fight while Marty Frank was sitting next to her thinking about Pop's business. Oh, I see. And, and Marty was much too absorbed to know what was happening. But why did she kill Pop? Because of Joy. What do you mean? Well, her whole idea in getting rid of Marty was to frame Pop. The old guy had a hold on Joey she couldn't break. Then the unexpected happened. What unexpected? Joey, the big dope, developed guilt feelings and was going to throw himself at the chair. Oh, you never know, do you? Oh, well. Hank, don't you think the horse has many advantages over the automobile? Well, you can't eat an automobile. I mean, lie back in a carriage and to listen to the trot, trot, trot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So romantic and so peaceful. Darling, have I told you tonight how lovely you are? Not yet. It never hurts. Yeah, like a moonbeam on a... Ann, look at me. What was the matter? Would you kill a couple of men just to get me? Don't be silly. Of course not. But I'd slaughter a couple of dozen women. And so closes tonight's Crime Club story, Death is a Knockout. Stedman Coles wrote the radio script. Roger Bauer produced and directed. Tonight's cast included Sidney Smith as Hank Barnum, Ted DeCorsia as Joey Troy, Barbara Joyce played Mabel Smith, Bill Smith was Pop Evans, Arthur Vinton was heard as Marty French, and Joan Tompkins was Ann Cooper. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. We have the very exciting story of love and politics in which the deciding vote was cast by death. It's called Hearses, Don't Hurry, by Stephen Ransom. In the meantime? Well, in the meantime, there is a new crime club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we'll look for you next week. This program came from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. by experts.
Mutual Broadcasting System presents Murder by Experts with your host and narrator, the noted mystery writer, Brett Halliday. Mr. Halliday is creator of the world-famous detective character, Michael Shane, author of 25 mystery novels, and whose latest work, This Is It, Michael Shane, has just been published. Good evening. This is Brett Halliday. Each week at this time, Murder by Experts brings you a story of crime and mystery which has been chosen for your approval by one of the world's leading detective story writers. Tonight, our guest expert is the noted mystery novelist Ursula Curtis. From the thousands of thrillers she has read and heard, Miss Curtis has selected a fast-moving, intriguing story of a man seeking to use the elements to cover murder, as written by that master of suspense, Harold Swanton. And now we present... Lawson Zerby in Conspiracy. So I'm a murderer. So people look at my picture in the papers and point at it and shudder. I wonder how many of them are entitled to do that. I wonder how many of them are murderers too, in their minds only the law between their hands and the throat of someone they hate. You take a city, see? A city full of people, the pious and the profane, the innocent and guilty, with their loves and hates, their pride and avarice and jealousy. And in that city, a pronouncement is made that on this date, between this hour and that one, there is no law, no retribution, that the crime of murder will go unpunished. How many of them would stand still? How many? Would you? It sounds like a philosophical problem. But it happened. The city was Greendale, Oregon. And the thing that set it free from the law for 24 hours was the Columbia River. Oregon Times, Kennecott speaking. Joe, this is Flournoy. Oh, yeah, Chief. Just got a report from the sheriff. It's getting tough out on the 7th Street levee. Yeah, I just heard the news over the radio. If the river busts through, they'll start looking for Greendale somewhere off the coast of Japan. But they got the army out there. I thought they'd take... They're losing ground, Joe. The levee might hold another hour, maybe more, but you'll go tonight, and I want you there when it happens. Uh, You're liable to pick me up off the coast of Japan. I'll send the boat after you, sweetheart, but phone that story in first. You know, color stuff. I was there. I saw it happen. Hot coffee, sweating soldiers, man versus nature. Got it? Yeah. Okay, Chief. Great. Now get going. You've got 15 minutes to get there. In ten minutes, I was driving through Greendale, a low, flat, flimsy town with nothing between it and the Columbia River but a levee. Flournoy was right. If the levee gave way, Greendale would go down the drain like wet cornflakes. I hit 60 on Willamette Avenue, heading toward the 7th Street levee. That's when I passed Marilyn's apartment. And that's what started me thinking again about Marilyn. She was beautiful. She was a two-timer. And she was the one human being on this earth I wanted to kill. I'd promised myself weeks before that I'd get her out of my mind, that hate was no good for anyone, but she kept coming back. That vicious, heartless laugh of hers. The brittle voice. The way her eyes could smile at you while she drove a French heel into your stomach. Joe Kennecott, Oregon Times. Reporter, huh? Okay. How's it look? Uh, You can see for yourself. Look at that river boil down there. Yeah. Levees like a hunk of Swiss cheese. Hey, over there. Pull the truck around. No, no, to the left, man. It was a weird scene. Men, trucks, equipment fighting the river in the glare of those gas lamps. Heaving sandbags, pouring gravel, trying to save a town they all knew was doomed. My eyes took it all in. My pencil was making notes, but my mind was on Marilyn. 
wondering if she was back in that apartment in Greendale, hoping she was asleep, that somehow she'd get washed out to sea with the rest of the rubbish. Then suddenly, everything stopped still. My pencil stopped writing. My eyes shut out the scene in front of me. It was so simple. I could kill Marilyn. The river would cover for me. Hold it, fellas! Uh, there's no use punching any longer. We're licked. She'll break through any minute. Pull the equipment out. Evacuate. That's an order. And you, uh... Kennecott. Yeah, Major. Take your car and beat it down to Greendale. Tell them they've got five minutes to get to high ground. Understand? Yes, sir. They say all murderers are crazy. Maybe they're right. All I know is that I hit 70 on the river road down to Greendale, hoping against hope that Marilyn would still be in that apartment so I could kill her before the flood came. Marilyn! Marilyn! Joe! Joe, what are you... There's a flood on the way, baby. Yeah, it came over the radio. I was just throwing a few things together to take with me. You're wasting your time. What do you mean, Joe? Hey, what are you going to do with that lamp? You aren't going, baby. Now, look, honey, don't be silly. I'm not going to lug that lamp out of here. You aren't going anywhere. No, no, you're not. Joe. Hey, well, wait a minute. You're crazy. Joe, help! Help! <laughs> no. I looked down at her for a minute and set the lamp back on the table. I began to feel dizzy. The floor seemed to be swaying underneath my feet. I wasn't faint. Just uh, dizzy. The door was open. Then I watched it close. Then open again. I, I wasn't dizzy at all. The building was swaying. The flood had come. I ran into the hall. Right smack into a guy. A little pasty-faced uh, guy standing oh, right outside hey, the door. Hey, Look, mister, let me out of here. No, you I, don't. You can't stop me. Now, wait a minute. Let go of me, here. Let go. No you yell for help. Come on. Now, no one's good. Let go of me. Hey. I got him. I got him. I, got him. I tackled him at the end of the stairs. We went down to get him to the bottom end over end. I knew he'd seen it. I knew I had to kill him, too. But I was dead right now. The main door was open. Water pouring in. Foot deep in the lobby. Don't. Please don't. Let me go. Too late, Let me pal. go. Let me go. The water. I can't. do no, Let me go. No, no. Too Let me bad, go. mister. Murder's a solo job. A solo job. Door. Now. Oh. Help. Someone. Help. Help. I hit my head on the door. It was all the chance he needed. He scrambled outside into the flood. Took off down the street with me after him. The water was two feet deep now, and the buildings were beginning to move. Help! Help! I was gaining on him. Thirty feet. Twenty. Then... The telephone pole went down between us. I saw the broken wire graze him. There was a crackle of flame, and he went down. So I stopped worrying about him. Started thinking about me. The main force of the flood must have hit it at that moment. Suddenly, everything was water. I was tossed down like a peanut shell in a typhoon. I remember reaching out for something solid, finding it, and then nothing. Just relax now. You're all right. Uh... All right. Oh, where am I? In the hospital. What? What happened? <laughs> You're a lucky man. They picked you up right in the middle of it. Had quite a time making you let go of that telephone pole, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I did. 
Telephone pole. Nothing wrong with you but a few bad bruises and shock. Uh, Doris, uh, give me a hand with this patient, will you? Yes, doctor. Just take it easy now. Everything's all right. Yeah. Everything's all right. I don't know how long I slept. One hour. Maybe six, but... It was still dark when I suddenly found myself awake in a cold sweat listening. The floor. That's where she was. On the floor. Dead. The flood? Not the flood officer. Murder. It was murder. No. No. He saw me. He saw me. Fight. Terrible fight. Tried to kill me. Water. Water all over. The flood. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't breathe. Uh... By now, I knew his voice. They must have picked us up together, put us in the same hospital room. A thousand crazy thoughts hit me all at once. Kill him right there. Jump out the window, run. Anything but face it when he woke up. I started to get out of bed and then stop. There was someone else in the room. Uh, what do you make of it, Nurse? Well, I don't know, Doctor. Well, the man's had a terrible shock, of course. It's amazing he wasn't killed. Yes, I know. He's been going on like that for an hour. The same thing over and over. Murder. Something about the, the flood covering it up. Then a fight. Hmm. Well, maybe you're right. I think we'd better at least pass it on to the police. Uh, still, uh, might be the result of shock, of course. The fact that he repeats it over and over, detail for detail. The death staring you in the face like that, you don't stop to think about consequences. The explanations could come later. I had to get out of that room right now. I fumbled in the dark for my clothes, threw them on, stepped out into the hall. Uh, Paul Revere! <gasps> Where do you think you're going, little man? Oh, Florio, I, I, I get tired of sitting around here. I thought you might need some help. Oh, you thought I might need some help, eh? <laughs> Nurse? Yes, Mr. Flournoy? Your number one patient's about to blow the joint. Oh, look, Chief, I... Joe, leave it to me, will you? So, you're a hero. So you drive like mad to warn the town and get caught in the flood. You don't have to go overboard. Mr. Flournoy's been pacing the hall like an expectant father. Well, uh... uh, uh, Thanks, Chief. I am not going to lose my best reporter because he's too dumb to know when he ought to stay in bed. Because that, sweetheart, is just where you're going. Uh, Look, Chief, Hey, don't butt in. You've been through hell tonight. You're lucky you're alive. Now, get in that room and get back to bed. The doctor's ought a hypo to make you sleep. Uh, nurse. Yes, sir. Just to make sure he doesn't get any more wild ideas, give me his clothes. I was licked. And I knew it. They hustled me back to bed. And the nurse poked a needle into my arm. And I let go. I let the dark close in on me. Not caring now. I was tired... So tired. Well, good morning, Mr. Kennecott. Hmm? Oh, so... <laughs> about time you woke up. It's almost ten o'clock. It's ten? How about some breakfast? Oh, no. No, no, no breakfast, nurse. I, uh... Oh, looking for your roommate? I... He's still asleep. We put the screen around his bed to cut down the light a little. Uh, I see. Uh, oh, Mr. I Willis can't. is waking up, too. Uh, I better have a look. Oh, wait a minute. Yes? No. Uh, no use disturbing, Mr. Willis. Uh, let me get dressed and uh, get out of here first. Only take me a minute. Huh? Nurse. Oh, I'd better get rid of that screen. Yes, nurse. Mr. Willis. Well, how are you feeling this morning? Better, thanks. I saw her start get for the, the screen. screen out of our way. Turned away just in time. Yeah. My stomach was tied in knots, knowing it could happen any minute I, now. I don't know. Any minute, Mr. Willis would point the I'm finger really at me and say, hungry. There's the man. Mr. Kennicott. Yeah, yeah. This is Mr. Willis. Oh, uh, hello, Mr. Willis. How do you do? Mr. Willis had a little flood trouble, too. Nurse. Those bandages on his head. Here, now, take it easy. Electric shock. He's blind. I know now how that guy in Louisiana felt when they sat him in the electric chair and the switch didn't work. Willis. 
The guy who saw me standing over Marilyn's body just before the flood hit was blind from that jolt of electricity he got when the pole fell. I, uh, I took my time now, waiting for the strength to come back to my knees. I dressed carefully and left. Flournoy was waiting for me in the hospital lobby. There was someone with him. This is Lieutenant Belshaw of Homicide, Joe Kennicott. I heard about you, Joe. Nice work. Thanks. Uh, homicide? Yeah. We got a murder on our hands. Or the lieutenant has a murder. We got a story, a great one. What's that? Conspiracy. Huh? Oh, no. Wait a minute, Florida. No, no, that's right. Conspiracy to commit murder. A partnership. We know who one of the partners is already. Yeah, who? The Columbia River. The cover-up. Accessory after the fact. I don't get it. Flournoy is trying to say we picked up a woman's body this morning. Knocked around pretty badly. No identification yet. He thinks she was murdered. I don't. You still think Willis is making it up? The guy took 220 volts with the water up to his knees. His head's still spinning. He's not responsible for what he says. Uh, Willis? The little guy up in your room upstairs. Uh, Did you hear him say anything in his sleep last night, Joe? No, uh, I uh, I don't remember much, of course, but... Sure, uh, sure. I still don't get it. Well, come on, I'll tell you about it on the way up. We're going to have a little talk oh. with Mr. Willis right now. Please, gentlemen, I can't remember now. I don't know what happened. It's all very oh, confusing. You've got to try, Willis. Now look, Chief, the guy's sick. I he don't know about that. What do you mean, Lieutenant? Willis, you've had a pretty rough ride during the past 18 hours. I know that. I want to make it as easy for you as I can. Well, then please go away, will you? Sure. After you level with us. Ten minutes ago, I was willing to write this thing off as a flood death. Now, I'm not so sure. Listen, Lieutenant, I told you You've got to understand one thing, Willis. If it's murder, one thing can lick us. Time. We've got to move now. So let's go over it again. Pete, say, Flora, you come here. here. Describe the series of facts. The guy's off his base. Can't you see that? I don't think so. Well, all you have to do is look. Sure, he's shaken up, but but there's something else. He's scared. You had a fight with someone. Fell downstairs, almost drowned. I told you I was dreaming. You don't dream the same thing over and over for an hour and 20 minutes without a reason. And we picked a woman's body out of the wreckage this morning. She could have been murdered. She could have lived in that apartment on Willamette Avenue. Who who was she? We don't know. There's nothing to identify her. Now, Willis, I asked for a straight story when I got here. I haven't got it yet. If I don't get it, I might jump to the standard conclusion. What? what, What's that? That you murdered her. But but that's that that, that's not it at all. a man did it. I, I saw him. That's more like it. He, he, he tried to kill me, too. He'll, he'll try again if well, he gets forget a chance. That. Just give us the story. <clears throat> well, I, I ran into the building because I thought I heard someone call for help. A, a woman. The water must have come when I got to the second floor hallway because the building started to sway, sort of, and the doors flew open. I saw him standing there. She was dead on the floor. Yeah? That's when he came after me. Tried to kill me. We, we rolled down the stairs to the bottom and... He hit his head on the door. And you broke loose? Yes. I, I... I don't remember anything after that. That's all, huh? That's enough. Uh... Uh, Mr... Mr. Willis, uh, What did this man look like? Oh, uh... Dark hair. About six feet, I guess. Medium built. About, uh, your size, Joe. Yeah. Do you think you could identify him... I mean, that is, if you could... If, if I could see him, yes, yes, I, I could identify him. Now, please, please let me rest. I'm not... Sure. Very well. Thanks, Willis. That's what we came for. We'll get back to you when you feel better. What about his eyes? Well, the doctor says it's temporary, due to shock. He might get his sight back any time. Any time, huh? Yeah, 
Well, Joe, how was that for a story? Oh, it's a great one, Chief. It's a great one. I wanted to scream it in his ear right then. Tell him the other half of it. That this was the craziest setup he'd run into if he'd lived a thousand years. Yeah. How's that for a story, Flournoy? Right here in your office. The guy you're talking to. Good old Joe Kennicott, the boy wonder. There's also the murderer you're looking for. The hunk of human drama, study in psychology. Here's a law-abiding guy. We don't know who he is. Maybe a bookkeeper, maybe a drug clerk, anyone. He owes to the line, cuts his lawn on Sunday, turns his paycheck over to his wife, obeys traffic signals. You know, the flood comes. Willis had me. Big cover up. And I knew it. Nothing. I run out now. They'd add up a second. Something else. So I had no to stop Willis, too, before he opened his eyes. Suddenly breaks and loose. that wasn't exactly cinch. Material witness, That's probably a cop, took. watching him every Hopefully second. Consequences. Waiting for those Bingo. bandages to come off so he they could hustle him over to police headquarters. So he could put the finger on me. It was 11 that night. Just 23 hours after I killed Marilyn that Flournoy rushed into my office. Joe, get your coat. Huh? We're meeting Belshaw at the hospital. Mr. Willis just came out of it. He can see. To Flournoy, it was a wild ride through the rain to the hospital. To me, it was a procession. From condemned row to the gas chamber. And there was no way out. No way out. <laughs> Come on, Joe. Lieutenant. Flournoy. Kennicott. He got here in a hurry. Let's go up. You better wait here. They're bringing him down. Going to take him over to headquarters. Oh, there he comes now. Just got out of the elevator. Uh, Lieutenant, wait a minute before you go. What is it? About this guy, Willis. Lieutenant, there's something I want to tell you. Uh... Oh, Lieutenant. Hey, Kelly. The main levy's starting to go. Hold the parts is ordered there immediately. The main levy? Holy cow, she'll take the whole north end of town. All right, Kelly. Oh, let me go with him. No, I'm at bat this time, kid. I'll go with the lieutenant. You take care of Mr. Willis. Yeah. Yeah. I'll take care of Mr. Willis. <laughs> I turned the collar of my overcoat up. Kept my face away from him as I bundled him into the car. The back seat, of course. Hoping he wouldn't spot me until I got him away from there. Alone. Just stay on North 2nd Street a ways, Mr... Uh, Kennicott. Yeah, Mr. Kennicott. I guess it's best you take me home. Under the circumstances. You, uh... Live in the North End? Yes. Good. It was the kind of luck you can have only once. Yeah. A split second before the axe fell. Just as I was about to lay it in the lieutenant's lap, the river saved me. And it would save me again. He lived in the North End, right where the second flood would hit when the main levee went. He wouldn't get away this time because I'd made sure. And no matter what the question was, I had the answer. Willis lived in the North End. I was driving him home. We hit a deserted section, manufacturing district. It was dark, blinding rain. Just right. Then... Stop the car, Mr. Kennicott. Huh? I said stop the car. What's the idea, Willis? What, what Shut up. You... Now get out. Hey, look, wait, wait a minute. Did you hear what I said? This is a 38, Kennicott. I'll let you have it, so help me. Hey. But look, look I... You made a bad mistake, Kennicott. Mistake? That woman they found this morning. They'll never identify her. I made certain of that. She's my dear departed wife. Willis, you... You mean you... You know I killed her, Kennicott. You saw it when the door flew open. Oh, wait! Wait a minute, Willis. Huh? Thought it'd make a nice piece of blackmail, didn't you? That's why you didn't identify me. But you made a mistake. I'd never hold still for blackmail. You... 
You knew I was in the other bed at the hospital. Sure. I faked the blindness. Tried to get something over my face before you woke up. Okay, can I got... Now, listen to me, Willis. I didn't see your wife. I didn't know you murdered her. I thought it was you who saw me when... Oh, give me that gun. Give it to me. Let go. Let me go, will you? That's it. Oh, I got the gun. You will shoot me, will you? No. No, can I got... Don't shoot. Don't shoot. Get me. Takes care of you, Willis. Yeah. We all learned something, Flournoy. A lot of us could kill. Something... Something like the Columbia River washed the law away. It wasn't such a coincidence after all. Two guys. Same town. Same apartment house. <coughs> Two women. They hated enough to kill. I'm... I'm sorry for you, Joe. Skip the sympathy, Chief. I know I'm gonna die. And so the curtain falls on conspiracy, which was chosen by guest expert Ursula Curtis. Miss Curtis is author of the newly published novel, The Second Sickle. And now, as host and narrator of Murder by Experts, it's my privilege to welcome and introduce to you Mr. Lawrence G. Blockman, Vice President of the Mystery Writers of America, an organization of nearly 300 of America's foremost writers of mystery and detective stories. Mr. Blockman. Thank you, Brett. Each year, the members of the Mystery Writers of America are called upon to vote for what, in their opinion, is the best radio mystery program of the year. To the winning program goes a statuette of Edgar Allan Poe, known as an Edgar, which is to mystery writers what an Oscar is to Hollywood. Five of the foremost radio mystery programs are voted upon by our members. The winner by an overwhelming majority, was murder by experts. It gives me great pleasure, on behalf of the Mystery Writers of America, to present to Robert Arthur and David Cogan, the producer-directors, the Edgar Allan Poe Award for the Best Radio Mystery Program of 1949. Mr. Cogan? Mr. Blockman, it makes me very happy to receive this tribute from the Mystery Writers of America. On behalf of Mr. Arthur and myself, I want to take this opportunity to thank those who made the winning of this award possible. The writers and actors who lent their talents to this program, our music director, Emerson Buckley, our arranger, Richard DuPage, engineer, Don Williamson, sound man, Walter Shaver, our announcer, Phil Tonkin, and a mutual broadcasting system. And two, I want to thank our many listeners for their thousands of kind letters. Tonight's play, Conspiracy, was written by Harold Swanton. In our cast were Lawson Zerbe, Miriam Wolfe, Ronald Dawson, Frank Behrens, and Robert Donnelly. All characters in our story were fictitious, and any resemblance to the names of actual persons was purely coincidental. Phil Tonkin speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. That's going to do it for the show this week. If you want to find more from the Crime Club, Murder by Experts, past episodes of Case Closed, and thousands of other old-time radio shows, just visit relicradio.com. You'll find all the podcasts there, our shoutcast stream, and if you'd like to help support it all, our donate button. 
visit donate.relicradio.com or click on one of the buttons on the website. Your support makes all of this happen and has for the past 15 years. Thanks to those who have helped out over those years, and thanks for joining me today. Be back next Wednesday with another episode of Case Closed. Case Closed.